questions you have. And afterwards, I don't just want a Q and A. I actually want to hear what you care about that doesn't have to be stated in the form of a question. <laughs> because what matters to me and why I'm running for Congress is I am running for Congress to raise up the voices of people who have been shut out. And everywhere I go in this district, I hear people who are angry, uh, people who feel like they got some ideas, but they don't matter in the political system. Parents, I, I talk to parents all the time. I've been very involved in the opt out movement. Um, parents and teachers who talk about how they feel like I'm the mom of a special needs kid and I feel like my voice isn't being heard on Common Core or on basic curriculum. I talk to farmers who have had to shut down their operations because our entire economic system isn't designed to support those farmers of the middle that are essential to a thriving rural economy. Those mid-scale farmers with gross incomes between 40,000 and 400,000 who we invest in our communities and they feel like they don't have voice. I talk to small business owners who can't get a $64,000 loan to bring on new staff, fix the bathroom, and they feel like both Republicans and Democrats have left them behind. They just don't feel like they have a voice in our current political system. And then people who 20 years ago would have, and been right to, expect that they could have a secure, well-paid job with benefits, and who are now working 25 hours a week, maybe having to take on another job, not secure in their job, don't have benefits, and feel like, again, the system isn't working for them. So, so I'm running to raise up those voices. And let me tell you a little bit about who I am and then a little bit about some policy issues that I care about. But at court, we're talking about a fundamental brokenness in Congress, a fundamental corruption in the system, and the ways in which I believe together we can take that on. So I grew up in uh, a uh, dairy community. Um, in rural Vermont. My last name is not made up. <laughs> um, teach out is Dutch. I came from teat sort. Uh, I'm an amateur genealogist. It looks like uh, the, the legend is we came up the Hudson and uh, settled uh, first in Abraham teat sort settled in Schenectady and then died Abraham teach out in Dutchess. <laughs> uh, and then uh, farther upstate New York and rural Vermont, which is where I'm from. So I was a teenager during the dairy crisis of the 80s and I've been very influenced by uh, seeing what rural communities have gone through, trying to make a thriving economy with trade deals that aren't helping us and a federal policy that's subsidizing big ag but leaving the farmer of the middle behind. Uh, I went to college and then my first job out of college was I was a special ed teacher's aide um, I care a lot about education. I believe every kid needs art, music, sports, recess. <laughs> um, and uh, that we should be supporting teachers through mentoring and teacher centers, not pushing down a high stakes testing regime uh, with a uh, common core that just isn't working and really demoralizing our teachers. Um, and then for the last, I went to law school. Uh, I hope you forgive me. <laughs> Really, for the last 12 years, um, in different ways, I have been fighting for the soul of our democracy. Um, I was the uh, national, the first national director of the Sunlight Foundation, which is one of the largest anti-corruption organizations in the country, fighting for transparency in federal contracting. We work Republicans, Democrats, everybody. We just want to know who's getting our contracts. Right? Um, after that, after the crash of 2008. I co-founded a group dedicated to breaking up big banks um, in the wake of the crash. I had a day job, but I always believed in organizing effect, organizing effect. That's the way we get things done. So we came together and got 90,000 petition signatures to Harry Reid on Glass-Steagall and other bills to break up big banks. We brought citizen lobbyists to Washington, and we held 178 events around the country with people educating each other about what we should do in terms of financial reform. We got some things done in Dodd-Frank collectively. We worked with 250 other labor and um, uh, consumer groups. So got a long ways to go. But what we got done, we got done because people's voices were raised up and we shared, you know, shared what we cared about. What we still have to do, which really affects this area, is get those banks to lend. <coughs> to lend to local small business.
businesses and even the skilled farmers. You can get a $2 million loan, but you can't get a $60,000 loan. Um, and, then, and then you may know I ran for governor a couple of years ago. Um, and I was so proud to work with what I think is one of the most extraordinary communities, grassroots communities in recent history, that led one of the most extraordinary environmental victories in the last several decades, which is the fracking ban in New York City. I know there are people in this room who did something on that, so thank you. <laughs> but how did that happen? It wasn't supposed to happen, right? If you'd asked, you know, the Las Vegas odds on a fracking ban in New York State in 2011, they'd say, no, it's not going to happen because fossil fuel companies have too much power. They have too much lobbying power. The way it happened is local communities educating themselves, raising up their voices, insisting on the facts, talking about health, talking about water, talking about air quality and kids being affected by nausea, talking about property values, talking about real things that affect people raising up those voices until the state uh, passed the fracking ban. After the fracking ban, I, um, I don't know if you know Josh Fox. Um, Josh Fox made the movie Gasland. He and I and a few others did a 17 town and village tour um, uh, talking about how if we want to really ban fracking, we have to build renewable energy. So renewable energy. We have to invest in geothermal and micro hydro. And this area, the land of little rivers, this area is so prime for being a center of, of moving forward in solar and renewable energy, micro, hydro, and, and ground source heat. <coughs> but again, it's people coming together in communities like this and talking. That's, that's how we get um, change to happen. And I also worked with parents and teachers, um, as I mentioned before, um, against Common Core on the opt-out movement. Uh, we haven't gotten everything we wanted, but it changed state policy. It changed federal policy. Uh, we got a long ways to go, but that wasn't some top-down organization that did it. That was people coming together, raising up the voices of people who've been shut out. Um, but the core issue here is why are people's voices shut out in the first place? You know, we're supposed to have a democracy. And um, not to put it too fine a point on it, but it's we have a corrupt system. Um, Congress is gridlocked, but it's also corrupt. And it's not like Albany where it's illegal corruption. Um, it's legal corruption in Washington that is slowing us down and keeping us from where we should be, that is leading to this radical inequality that is taking away our jobs. And that legal corruption is the way we function. I don't just mean super PACs and Citizens United. I do mean that. By the way, I was cited in dissent in Citizens United, so you know where I stand on Citizens United. I don't like it. Um, we ought to overturn Citizens United. We have an opportunity to do that in front of the Supreme Court Justice. But the core problem here is the way people raise money right now is, um, I mean, there's no other way to put it. It's crazy. We never designed a system like does anybody know how much time a member of Congress spends raising, a typical member of Congress spends sitting in a little room, picking up a phone, walking through sheets of paper, calling the richest people they know, and trying to find a joke to make them laugh, so I'll give them $2,000. What percentage do you think? 80%. 80%. You're, even, you're a pessimist. <laughs> <laughs> you're no fun. <laughs> It's, it's between 30 and 70%. See, I was close. You were close. <laughs> <laughs> but think about that. There's nothing else that you do more than 30% of your time, whether it's research or constituent service. So your primary job, your first job, is sitting in a room talking to the wealthiest people you can find. That doesn't make any sense. So that means then what the core qualification for office is, do you know a lot of rich people, or do you have policies that really suit a lot of rich people. That shouldn't be our qualification for office. I don't mind a random question in the middle. So, so according <laughs> to uh, CBS News, yeah. there's a Republican congressman from San Diego, I think, who's saying, no, I won't play. Yeah. Because the pressure is coming from the party, the Democratic Party telling the senators they have to do this, Republican Party. Are you going to be one of the ones who's going to say, no, I won't play for 30 hours a week on the telephone? Well, I'm lucky. 
Um, because, uh, and I, I don't think I'm a systemic answer. We have to change the system. We have to move to publicly financed elections. We have to do that. If you want that incredibly talented school secretary who knows everything about what's happening to be running for office, you need publicly financed elections. You can't ask her to know a bunch of money there. Um, but the, the, here's how I'm doing it. I gotta reach, in this district, I gotta reach people when we've lost a lot of local media. It's not coming from the National Party, it's coming from my desire to reach your neighbor who might not read the Walton Reporter tomorrow, or hoping there's a story. <laughs> right? um, uh, so I, it's actually, it's coming from my desire to reach Democrats, Republicans, Independents, that, that's, the, that's the push. I want to have a publicly financed system. When I, I, I was a, a director of online organizing for Howard Dean's campaign, um, 2003. So, and I've done a lot of work in online organizing. So I, I actually know how to, uh, how to reach people and build a small donor base. And I have 30,000 donors right now with an average donation of $40. So I am free to be here and listen to you. And when I'm in Congress, I will be free to be taking your call and not taking the call. Not, that, not to say that you don't have millions of dollars. I do. <laughs> <laughs> if I did, I wouldn't be. <laughs> I'd be a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, it's actually been really important to me to build this campaign in a way that matches how I want to represent you in Congress um, so that they're connected, they're not separate, so that I don't have to be a year from now, I can be dealing with watershed issues, common core, <coughs> renewable energy, broadband. Those are the things I should be working on. Jobs, not, why did he, uh, last time I talked to him, I think he really said he cares about the flower garden and wherever. You know, it's just absurd. Our, con our Congress members are becoming experts in rich people's lives instead of experts in the economy. It's a real problem. Um, so back to, <laughs> um, uh, this sort of core issue, I believe we need public financing of elections at every level. Every level. And I will push for it as I have pushed for it for decades. Because you want me to not have that fear in my eyes that there's some donor that's not going to like something I'm going to say. You can feel it. People don't want to vote for somebody who looks scared, right? Too many of our politicians look kind of scared. They get that glassy donor look. <laughs> what if I say something wrong? <laughs> And you know, part of the reason we don't have turnout is because people feel like politicians aren't as human and real. Um, so I, I think we need public financing of elections for a whole bunch of reasons. I think we need to be very clear and name names when it comes to a handful of big companies that are trying to take over our politics. And we should call them the monopolies that they are. Time Warner, we don't have an option. There's a, in, in Verizon, um, uh, Monsanto with seeds. Uh, in, in certain areas, you don't have a choice but to sell to Tyson or to Pilgrim. So you aren't a free chicken farmer if you basically are stuck with selling to one local monopoly. It's a problem across the board. We're seeing a radical collapse over the last 30 years where it constantly merger, 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 merger. And those companies are the companies that then turn around and spend their money on lobbying instead of spending their money on building a better widget. I really believe in markets. This is part of the reason I, I care so much about building the economy. I really believe in open markets. But you don't want your farmer uh, who is, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, your local dairy farmer to be thinking, what, what joke can I tell to crack up my local Congress member so I can get a grant? You want your farmer to be thinking, how can I use ground source heat to make my operation more effective. Look at Big Pharma for just one example. Big Pharma's firing chemists and hiring accountants to figure out how to get out of tax laws. I want to live in a world where pharma isn't overcharging us, but rather competing to actually produce the best product. So here's some ideas I have for this um, area, the things that I would push for that are grounded in things I've been working on for a long, long time. One is, whatever your economic development vision is, you might think it's sneakers, <laughs> you might think it's garlic, <laughs> you might think it's tourism on 28. All of those are great, but they all require high speed, affordable, universal <coughs> broadband and cell service. We need it. You can't check seed prices. 
services without a budget. Uh, I talked to a far, the, uh, the guy who runs Lucky Dog this morning, and he's like, I do my, if, if the internet is down, I can't map my new crop rotation. You know, it's essential. If you want a garage, you need broadband so you can keep up with your customer service. If you're a student, you need broadband. So this is, this is an idea that I'm shamelessly stealing from uh, FDR. Um, FDR in the 1930s, um, in the face of extraordinary economic crisis, worked together with Republican senators on the REA, the Rural Electrification Act. Every last farmhouse gets electricity. Every last a trailer gets electricity. Every last schoolhouse gets electricity. We're going to figure it out by hook or by crook, different ways in different places. Great for the jobs going in, great for the jobs that it lit up. Ten years later, every last farmhouse, the second part of REA, <coughs> Rural Electrification Act, is going to get telephone. Um, so what is REA for the 21st century? Every last farmhouse gets broadband. Think of what that would do to this region. Think of the people who want to move <laughs> to one of the most beautiful places in the world and can't because they, they uh, can't work because of, of broadband. <coughs> It's a real drag, it's a real rural crisis, and I believe I can work with Republican Congress members on this issue because it's a rural issue across the country right now. Uh, a second area which I, I um, uh, oh, and by the way, the reason that's not happening isn't because this isn't sort of an obvious idea. Everybody knows that you need broadband now. It's not happening because the incumbents, and I don't mean people who are holding office, I mean Time Warner and Verizon, are blocking it. They are spending their money on lobbying, they are spending their money on campaigns, and we need to be very clear about who is getting in the way of us moving forward. A second area is sort of similar, it's renewable energy. Uh, we can have 100% renewable energy in New York State, we can do it. There's a wonderful Stanford study that showed how every area would get um, different, you know, different parts of renewable energy serving different areas. The thing that's blocking us I think the reason that we keep having infrastructure fights or, is uh, the fossil fuel industry has so much political power. So people sometimes talk about the need for a uh, technological breakthrough on renewable energy. We don't need a technological breakthrough. We need a political breakthrough. We need to talk about Exxon Mobil. We need to talk about the Koch brothers. We need to talk about the companies that are standing in the way of renewable energy. Um, a third area is we just got to lead the trade. I am, I've been holding forums about TPP or uh, participating in forums against the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but we also should repeal NAFTA. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to move forward on a 21st century trade vision that is not going back down this path that has not worked for us. We are importing right here, right here, we're importing um, uh, dairy protein from New Zealand, Mexico. Kids are eating apples from Peru, not from the neighboring orchard. Again, this serves some of the big ag companies, but it is not serving the farmer of the middle, which is the center of a thriving rural economy, and also the center of a healthy economy. Because mid-sized farmers have greater biodiversity, they um, treat the land better, they treat the uh, livestock better if they have livestock, they treat the workers better. Every, we're, we're sort of broken on food, and I think we're broken because of corruption, right? So uh, I, my vision for trade is that a 21st century trade approach, that actually ties in with war and peace in some ways, too. A trade is always about war and peace. It's never just about trade. Um, I don't want to be in a world where we are so dependent on goods from China <coughs> that if we have a foreign policy disagreement, that's a problem. 100% of our vitamin C now basically comes from China. 100%. Vitamin C. Um, and, then, and then in for sort of key components of drugs that many people use, it's 80, 90% key components are uh, in these numbers. I think in a future trade um, trade world, we should be looking at two different two different things that are, that are sort of at the core of my vision. One is we shouldn't be so dependent on another country that it's a problem when we have a foreign policy disagreement. So we should have trade, but not create dependence. We shouldn't have 100% of anything. Another is, we can make things here. I want to live in a world where people grow American, eat American, buy American, build American, sew, make sneakers, make tractors, 
here. And we can do that. We have the talent. We have the resources. And these trade deals have gutted our jobs, shipped them overseas, and forced us to compete with people who are making you know, pennies on that, um, pennies per hour. So I really believe, and I think you can see that, left, right, center. People are ready to move in a different direction on trade. Um, so those are, the, those are all part of the, the, um, the vision I have. Um, my campaign started a little over three months ago. Um, it's uh, been extremely exciting. Uh, we have Kirsten Gillibrand's support, Mike Hines' support, who some of you might know. Uh, tomorrow I'm getting endorsed by the CWA. <laughs> very excited about. NYSIT has endorsed. And th these endorsements are very meaningful to me because you know I, I, I'm happy to stand with American labor. I'm happy to stand with CWA workers against Verizon um, in this fight. And I've been very happy to work with teachers against the common core threat and the privatization threat. Um, but the core of our campaign has been local, Groups. We have about 18 <coughs> grassroots groups all around the district who are organizing our events, <laughs> um, and giving us suggestions, giving us feedback, sharing ideas. And, and we're building it that way because that's not just the way I want to win. It's the way that I want to, in Congress, be connected to all the communities of the 19th district. It's This district, as you know, has a beating heart wonderful independent spirit. People make up their own minds. They're not gonna vote on party lines. They're not gonna vote based on endorsements. They're gonna vote based on who they feel when the door is shut is gonna be fighting for them. I hope you can see that after you know, what I've been doing <coughs> last over a decade fighting for people whose voices are shut out, I will keep fighting for you and I don't even wanna shut the door. So thank you for coming out tonight, and I look forward to your comments and questions. And as I said before, you are so trained to ask questions, and I'm happy to answer questions. But um, this is also a chance for me to learn from you. So you don't have to say, oh, I have this problem, but I don't know how it relates to legislation. Just tell me the problem. Right? That's my job, is to figure out how it relates to legislation. And the whole thing with PPP yeah. is that it allows us to get goods at a lower price than we can create them ourselves. How do you change that? So I actually, my, the way I understand the TPP, um, and I disagree with Obama on this, is um, he sees, again, this is my understanding, not his, is that uh, there's a real uh, trade imbalance with China, and the way to right that imbalance is to join into a trade association with other countries. I think the way to deal with the trade imbalance with China is not to double down on a failed trade strategy, um, but actually change the trade strategy altogether. Um, what I want to see is a world in which, I think I talked about this, like one in five people are making something. We're in a society where people are making and growing things locally. And that does allow people to have fair wages, secure jobs, buying from something that, if not your neighbor, somebody from within 100 miles made. That is an overall more thriving economy. NAFTA has lost us jobs. There were a lot of promises about NAFTA. But they didn't come through. But if we're dealing with a society, with, with a competitive society that's paying your workers $15 a week, mm -hmm. and we're paying our workers $15 an hour, mm -hmm. how do we compete with that? The way we compete with it is changing our trade policy. So right now, our trade policy opens up our workers to that direct competition. <laughs> Your neighbor is competing with somebody who's getting $15 a week. They shouldn't have to be in direct competition. We can choose to prioritize American-made stuff with our trade policy. We don't have to have this uh, direct competition model. That's what I'm talking about, is going back to NAFTA and rewriting the way that we think about trade from the start. There's nothing, there's often in globalization talk, there's language which, which you know, you and I may disagree on that, and that's fine. But um, there's language which I, I really, okay. <laughs> which 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 you might hear sometimes, like um, the horse has left the barn, the train has left the station, <coughs> it's too late. That's never true in a democracy. 
If that was true in 1899, it would have been too late on a whole bunch of different things because you know steel and oil had way too much power. It's never too late. The idea of democracy is we get to decide, we here, not a few donors who like TPP, not a few big companies that like offshoring their money so they don't have to pay taxes. We here get to decide the kind of society we want to live in. And if we want to live in a society where people make things here and grow things here and raise things here, we've got to change our, our trade policy. So how does that translate into boosting the essential infrastructures that are needed, rural economies that are deteriorating since way before nationalism, this mm -hmm. new age of dairy farms that we got here in the early 90s, dairy farms were there are few and far between as we can see them now, even though our county is still a big dairy producer. Um, so how do you do that? I remember um, just two years ago when Hillary came to speak, I'm an, I'm a, an imagine instructor at SUNY Delhi, uh -huh. and I was just 2000, one of the fans of the Freedom Zoo, um, and she would often come to Delhi to uh, give the press conferences to, to make announcements. Yeah. And one of them was, uh, um, increasing the, um, uh, and, and strengthening broadband access to rural areas. That was over a dozen years ago. Yes. And when we were senator then, yeah. and um, she is she made some great strides. But how do you, <coughs> how does one hand help the other? You know, so that people will recognize this and say, heck with it. I'm going to Walmart. It's so much cheaper. I mean, there have been times when I've been <coughs> in the area, not yeah. here. Where I, I just I can't find it anywhere. Not only can I not find it anywhere else, but Walmart, it's cheaper too. But I, I can't find it anywhere else, so I go to Walmart for that one particular thing. How do we? Do you just raised a whole bunch of different things, and they're all really important. I, go to <laughs> <laughs> I said that they're all really important. So whatever that later. <laughs> Um, so I'm not, I don't know if I'll address all of them, but I can address a few. One, uh, which is, uh, um, I think it's a question about how we get there and where I, I believe our experience with fracking, with Common Core, is really important and is different than others, because we actually have to name names and take on the problem just directly and say why it isn't happening. Instead of saying, we're always gonna do this in partnership with the big companies. It's like, let's be really honest about how they are actively getting in the way of our future. And that's my political view, that's what I've always done. Um, so that's a strategy, even if we all have shared visions, that's a strategy, which I think you'll find, uh, look, it's just, uh, uh, it is consistent throughout everything that I've done that has succeeded. When we fight and win, it's because you're honest about who's getting in the way and don't sort of pretend that they're not in the way, and you're honest about the corruption of the money in the system. Uh, second, there's some infrastructure needs that are just really basic. Uh, I mean, let's talk about roads and bridges and water and flood mitigation and, you know, really basic needs. I'm a supporter, of, uh, as Hillary Clinton is, of infrastructure bank, uh, which would allow for uh, uh, you know, loans for projects like this, which are absolutely essential. Some of those are state level issues. I talked about that a lot in my gubernatorial race, just the sort of basic infrastructure of um, rural areas. Um, and then some of those are federal issues. There's a deep federal commitment to infrastructure. Infrastructure pays itself back. You know, if you want a small business economy, you gotta invest in infrastructure. Um, let's see, you've had a bunch of other interesting ideas in there. Um, oh, uh, you talked about Walmart. <coughs> So one of the things that's happened in retail is the incredible concentration in retail has led to outsized power of a few retailers. By the way, they're part of the reason that uh, dairy and other uh, uh, prices are even more out of control of the dairy farmers who are working harder than ever. And 1966, if you're a farmer, you get 40 cents on every dollar spent on food. Now it's 60 cents. Working harder and getting paid less. Some of that comes from retail putting real downward pressure and really controlling the products on their shelves. So uh, Walmart, I think this is about nine years ago, it was reported in the New York Times, uh, tells Coca-Cola what kind of sweetener to use. Why do you think Coca-Cola would listen to Walmart? <laughs> They're the biggest grocer in America. So 
suddenly, it's not just a shelf on which people get to come and buy different options. It is the shelf that, that controls the producers. Now, part of the reason you may not be able to find those goods on other shelves is Walmart might not be very excited about competing retailers. So it might tell Coca-Cola, hey, you know, or signal to Coca-Cola, um, hey, um, you should have a minimum number before you ship to any stores so that the small retailers get shut out. You, you guys see what I'm talking about? So, um, that, you know, sometimes people say, oh, the small retailers got shut out because they couldn't compete, but they're not necessarily competing on a <coughs> Um, and so I'm not going to be one to tell anybody, don't shop here, don't shop there. That's a, that's a personal choice. It is our job as a society to build a system that supports small retail, that supports small retail with affordable goods. Those aren't, you asked basically about all of America, but those are at least some ways. <laughs> I think, you know, um, at least I can show you a way, a way in which I think about things, because different issues are going to come up at different times, and this is like showing you. I always think about things in terms of power. Yeah. Um, first, a sort of comment that you invited, um, and then a brief question, um, <laughs> <laughs> which you can answer as, as you please. Um, a, a week ago, I got letters from two pension funds that I earned. One um, uh, basically said that under the new accounting that was written into the budget bill a year and a half ago at midnight um, changes how um, pension funds, how they can uh, value the assets they own. So that pension fund, uh, it's named by Rupert Murdoch, um, says, you know, it, it, it makes it look much healthier than it is. That's a very small pension fund. The other one that's Bigger. So Kim, uh, Kim is my campaign manager, and we're keeping track of comments. You okay. know, with not all of which we can, you know, right. but, but it's helpful for us to know what to look into. Okay. Yeah. And then the second part, which is also my, my bigger pension, I was counting on. I'm one of ten and a half million people who uh, were promised a pension on a multi-employer uh, basis. That one, uh, my multi-employer pension fund, uh, says. Um, it's going to go belly up uh, in 14 years, and that my pension will no longer be guaranteed by the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, and will be cut by two thirds. So that's a comment, is something yeah. to address. Um, the three questions are: Would you co-sponsor HR 676 if you're elected to the House <laughs> the single payer bill? Secondly, Social Security. Uh, what would you do to increase benefits and make it solvent as related to my pension yeah. going away? And third, on climate change, you talked primarily about electrical energy, which was roughly responsible for about a third of, of, of uh, gas. If, if, if elected, what would you do to address sources of including dairy farming uh, as well as many other things that are uh, sources of greenhouse gases that drive the air like critical situations. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to address some of, the, some of those questions. I'll tell you, you know, I think it's most useful to tell you uh, where I have deeper expertise mm -hmm. and where I will be pushing on. One is I will absolutely go to the wall to fight to protect against the privatization of Social Security that a handful of Republicans are trying to push for. Social Security is not only one of the most successful programs the United States has ever built. Uh, rumors about its insolvency are not often grounded in fact. And at some point, we might, might want to even hold some Social Security forums and just talk about the basic facts on Social Security. It is absolutely essential. I, uh, this is, it's a no way. Um, uh, I, I want to tell you the way in which I think about some of the many issues in healthcare, because you sort of, in two of your questions, raised some healthcare issues. Um, one, uh, follow the money, right? <laughs> Who's making outsized, outrageous profits right now in healthcare? Big pharma. Big pharma. Big Pharma um, can basically just set the price it wants to, regardless of whether that 
that's related to the price that it costs to produce it plus a little margin. It's almost arbitrary, the handful of uh, the, the power that Big Pharma has. Big Pharma, as I mentioned earlier, they're firing chemists and hiring accountants. Um, they're not investing in R&D as they did. And they're not investing because they're spending all their energy trying to focus on tax loopholes and gouging people. And the effect on modern society is devastating. Because let's just take something as innocuous as a foot cream. <laughs> if you have a pharmaceutical marking it up from $5 to $400 and just taking away the profits, that may be fun for that pharmaceutical company. But $400 is a lot of money. And uh, people are having to decide whether or not they can pay for, for a basic pharmaceutical needs. So two things on that. One, absolutely you should have the ability to negotiate drug prices. That's a, something I will absolutely pay. And second is we got to look at the monopoly problem. We have a no monopoly problem in pharma. Um, we also have a price fixing problem. Um, so we have monopoly in every industry. Well, this is I'm, I'm you know I like to say I'm a uh, I'm a FDR Democrat and a Teddy Roosevelt Republican. I want to do some trust busting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we stopped the Comcast Time Warner merger. We have put breaking up banks on the table. We can actually get back to some real trust busting. And in pharma, it's absolutely essential. So given that trust busting is part of my history, my work. Uh, what I uh, what I care about in the small business economy, which is the other side of the hat. Um, the the one of the areas in which I believe that I can be a real leader is in pushing for taking on, uh, holding hearings, talking about the incredible abuses in the pharmaceutical industry. And the pharmaceutical industry is not doing so well on the PR game right now. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. Do you know anybody who likes Big Pharma? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you are. Oh, <laughs> mad. People are mad about Big Pharma, and they're right. And uh, just like after the crash of 2008, we had an opportunity to take on these big banks. We have an opportunity right now to take on Big Pharma. We should be seizing. Yes. I hope you don't mind. I wrote mine in the form of a question. I'm really proud that I brought a question. So when you're oh, like, thanks. Oh. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> um, and I just want to th say thank you because a lot of what you're saying really resonates with me. And when I listened to a podcast the other day, you were interviewed, and I got all excited, and I'm like, we have to go. So, so thank you for. What was the podcast? Yeah, um, it was actually from from your governor race, okay. uh, but it was still something that I should be doing more podcasts. I just don't think I have. Yeah, I, I did do that. I like them, and I search them. I drive all over Delaware County, which um, some want to relate to my, my questions, I guess. Um, and I know that you have strong feelings in, on the oversight of schools in New York, uh, from student testing to limited funding. Um, I'm a mother of two in the school district, and I'm also running for the local school board. Oh. And I'm wondering, as far as um, what are some of your insights that you can share with local people at our level and what we can be doing to make the changes that you're talking about? Because I do feel like you already brought it up that we feel that the system is corrupt and we don't know what to do or where to even start. Um, and, and how we can work towards improving the New York educational system, and then just some of the things that you hope to do while you're, if, when you're in office yes. <laughs> in Congress, so, um, that you hope to do. That was a fantastic. 